All right, well, we have been in the book of 1 Samuel for lots and lots of weeks. I was actually supposed to not preach tonight, but Jacob Dahl was going to preach. He's, he's our Ellensburg site pastor. He was going to be preaching, but his wife is like super pregnant, like not regular pregnant, like super pregnant, like so pregnant that on Tuesday, coming back from a wedding, we stopped in Ellensburg to have dinner. And he said, hey, bro. Um, and he just pointed to his wife and, and said, I don't think I can go to Pullman on Sunday and I said, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry we even ever asked you to go to Pullman. Our bad. So he asked uh, me to step in his stead today. So uh, we're in 1 Samuel. We're going to have a, a new dad, or I guess a, about to be dad, preach to us about fatherhood. Uh, but instead, we're going to tackle 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18, talking about the life of David and Jonathan and their connection to one another. So if you have a Bible, you can grab it and turn to 1 Samuel. Uh, chapter 18 is actually where we're going to start. Um, but I'm about to read you a statistics. I don't know who makes up statistics. You can, like, you can find a statistic on anything. But there is a statistic that tells us um, that, that upwards of 80% of people, 80%, this seems like absurd to me. You just Google stuff and you can find any statistic you want to back up anything you want. So I found one to back up what I'm about to tell you, okay? <laughs> not saying it's true, may or may not be, but it's on the internet. So I'm going to read it to you. Ready? Statistics tell us that upwards of 80% of the people would say they do not have one close friend. That seems absurd, right? That seems absurd. Now, I don't know what they define a close friend as versus an acquaintance, but that most people, they would say, 80% of people would say that, that you would be lucky to find one close friend in your life. One close friend, 80% people say that you would be lucky to have that. Um, and honestly, we live in a world where everyone's moving a lot. There's a fast pace a lot. And it's hard to find a friend when everyone around you is staring at their cell phone all the time. Right? Not, not that. F okay. Um, there's a lot of digital friendships happening. There's a lot of social stuff happening on the internet. There's a lot of places where you can tell the world about your life. But the question is, does anyone actually know your life? Or is it that whole, let me put my best foot forward and, and hide the rest put the best out front and don't let anyone see what's really going on in my life. And you could find yourself going, I'm actually pretty lonely and I don't have any friends. And, and often it's difficult to stay in touch with old friends. Um, if, if you have some friends from high school, you can go ahead and assume that they're not going to be your friends for the long haul. Like anybody in here have a friend from high school, like maybe three of you know somebody from your high school because you like want to erase all those years. You don't like anybody that knew you back then. Like if they pull out a yearbook, you like carry a lighter around at all times to set that thing on fire. But in college, a lot of times you make friends in college who become your lifelong friends. Um, but, but oftentimes it is hard to find a friend. So uh, I, I looked up the definition of friendship and in Webster's Dictionary, here's what the definition of friendship is. Friend, a friend is a person on the same side in a struggle. One who is not an enemy or a foe, but is an ally. Uh, a British publication once offered a prize for the best definition of a friend, and they got thousands and thousands of responses. And here are a few that made it into the top. The best definitions of friends. This is a, a, a British publication, not American, so it kind of reads interesting in a few spots. But, but here's a few of the, the, the winners. Uh, this says, one, a friend is one who multiplies joy, divides grief, and whose honesty is inviolable. The next one is one who understands our silence. Isn't that good? A friend is one who understands our silence. You, you ever been such good friends with someone that you can go on a long road trip and don't feel forced to talk? Like all you introverts are like, amen. <laughs> Let's do that. There's a girl on our staff named Samantha who's got a new roommate who's also introverted. And she said, I'm so excited to be in the house with someone I don't have to talk to. And that like brought her great joy. <laughs> I have a friend in the silence. Uh, the next definition is uh, a friend is someone, uh, is a volume of sympathy bound in cloth. Like weird, right? <laughs> British people. Uh, I guess wearing clothes, that's what that means, bound in cloth. Uh, the next one is, is a friend is, is a watch that beats for all time and never runs down. Uh, that's, that's pretty cute. The next one is uh, the winning definition read like this. It says a friend is one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. That is the definition of friendship based on this publication. Um, 
The, the truth is many of us have a lot of acquaintances. Many of us are friendly with people, but, but is there a biblical picture of friendship? So in studying this sermon, um, Timothy Keller, a guy that I trust, a guy that many of you have read and listened to for a long time, he, he calls this, he says, this is the rightly famous friendship of Jonathan and David. The rightly famous friendship of Jonathan and David. Jonathan is Saul's son. He's about 10 years older than David. And we are introduced to him in 1 Samuel chapter 14. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, this young guy named Jonathan has an armor bearer with him, a guy that bears his armor. And they're supposed to fight the Philistines and the Philistines are mocking them a little bit. And Jonathan and his armor bearer, this is how you get introduced to this dude, I love it. He comes out in 1 Samuel chapter 14 and it says that in one acre, you guys know what an acre is? Like small plot of land, you can run, but you like can't hide in an acre. So there's an acre and there's 20 men in the acre provoking Jonathan. And he goes out with his armor bearer and it says he killed 20 men in one acre. In one acre. And, and that, that's welcome to Jonathan, okay? So he is not a, a B-team kind of warrior. Like this dude knows how to handle a sword. His armor bearer goes with him. They take out 20 guys. The next thing in 1 Samuel chapter 15, you see that Saul is rejected as king. 1 Samuel 16, David is instated as king. Now this is the problem because Jonathan is the son of Saul. So you would think Jonathan would be the king next, but David instead is anointed by God to be the king. And in 1 Samuel chapter 17, guess what happens? Uh, you, you heard about this last week. David is in a story where the Philistines send out a guy named Goliath and they provoke them to fight. Well, David goes forward, fights Goliath, kills Goliath, ends up uh, winning the battle for the Israelites. And, and there's, a kindred, uh, there's a kinsmanship, a kindredness, that's the word I'm looking for, a kindredness that happens between Jonathan and David. Why? Because they've both been provoked by Philistines and both pulled out swords and killed people. That's a biblical kindredness. They, they are boys. You're like, oh, you remember that time I took on Goliath? Oh, you remember that time I took on 20 guys in an acre? And they like fist bump or something because they have a kindredness about the common enemy called the Philistine. Now, here's what's interesting. In 1 Samuel 18, Jonathan sees that David is going to be anointed as king. Now, again, he's in line to be anointed as king. But Jonathan sees that David has been anointed by God to be king. And Jonathan humbles himself and becomes David's dearest friend. And so I want to show you in the story this, this rightfully famous friendship of Jonathan and David. And I got to read to you about three different places in, in the story of 1 Samuel so you can get the narrative arc of who Jonathan is in David's life and how we can learn from that and be these kind of people for those around us. So in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse one through four, follow along. I'm going to read you the narrative story arc where Jonathan and David become friends. Uh, verse one, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Isn't that a great Bible verse? The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Use the word soul three times. David's soul, Jonathan's soul, knit together. I loved him like I loved my own soul. What a great Bible verse. And Saul took him that day. And he would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David. This is key. Made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Fourth time he used the word soul. Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was on him and he gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. This is the transition point. This is where Jonathan comes along and says, you have been anointed as king. I take off what is rightfully mine and I give it over to you. It would be the equivalent of, of Jonathan taking off a crown and putting it on David's head. Going, God has anointed you and I affirm that. God has called you to be something and I affirm that. All of you need someone in your life that knows who God's called you to be and they affirm that. Someone in your life that goes, I have seen God's hand on your life and I support it and I come beside it and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure you walk in that calling. Jonathan honors God's choice in David. What happens to Saul? Saul gets jealous of God's choice in David. So the son is honoring, but the father is not okay with it. Um, and then David takes it a step further, right? Um, th this is ridiculous in the Bible. Um, Saul is jealous of David because he's about to be king. So David does the only thing you should do in that moment, which is marry Saul's daughter. That goes well for you, right? 
Um, what's interesting is, is it's not a big problem in the Bible. Um, if, you, if you're ever playing Bible trivia and you want to know the only time in the Old Testament where the Bible says a woman fell in love with someone, it's, it's when Mikhail falls in love with David in the story of 1 Samuel. She falls in love with him and he marries her. And in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 20, it says, Saul, uh, now Saul's daughter, Michael, she, she loved David and they told Saul and this thing pleased him. So, so far it's like, Saul's like, okay, I know I have issues with jealousy with you, but you can have my daughter. Everything's going well. And then 10 verses later, Saul says this, and the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle as they often came out and David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. Chapter 19, verse 1. So Saul spoke to Jonathan and his sons, all the servants, that they should kill David. So 10 verses earlier, he's marrying his daughter and it's all good. 10 verses later, he's like, actually, I'm interested in killing David again. So Saul has this back and forth thing he's constantly going through. Now, th this is key. Uh, he wanted to kill David, but verse, later in verse one of chapter 19, but Jonathan, Saul's son, he delighted much in David. This, this is key. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore be on your guard in the morning, stay in the secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak to him about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, uh, his father and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David because he has not sinned against you and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in your hand and he struck down the Philistine and the Lord worked a great salvation for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Uh, why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan and Saul swore as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. So, so what happens here is you see this friendship between Jonathan and David coming to a place of adversity because Saul is going to go out and kill David and Jonathan comes along and says, David, you need to hide. Let me go talk to my dad. And he comes along and he's loyal and speaks on behalf of David to Saul. So that's what happens in chapter 19. Chapter 20, David is hiding from Saul in a field, but Saul wants David, this is like a movie, guys. Saul wants David to come to dinner in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 20. David doesn't show up. The next day, Saul wants him again. David doesn't show up. So Saul does the only thing normal in the Old Testament. Saul takes a spear and throws it against the wall. That's what happens. When David doesn't show up for dinner, Saul throws a spear against the wall and Jonathan jumps up, like flips over the table and runs out. Isn't that a great movie scene? You're like, where's David? He's not here. Oh, I'm throwing a spear. Do you guys have spears in your dining room? No, just Saul? Okay, cool. So, he, he's so frustrated that David's not there that he wants to kill him. So Jonathan runs out and he's, and he's gonna give the message. And so again, David is hiding. This is all gonna come together in a minute. I know there's a lot of scripture here. David is hiding in a field. Saul just threw a spear. Jonathan runs out. And he's like, I need to tell David to be careful. So he, he kind of, he shoots this bow and arrow thing way out to tell David, hey, it's me. You can come out of hiding. And in chapter 20, verse 40, you see this. Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and said to him, go and carry them to the city. He's, gonna, he's telling his guy, get out of here. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and he fell on his face to the ground and he bowed three times. Jonathan has just saved David's life. He's told him to run. He's told him to get out of here. And they kissed one another and they wept with one another. David weeping the most. There's a connection here. There's a union here in this friendship of protection, of loyalty, of covenant. There's this, David, you need to get out of here. I'm on your behalf. David, you need to come back. I have some information for you. David wept the most. Verse 42, then Jonathan said to David, go in peace because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed and Jonathan went in the city. So from now on, David is hiding out, trying not to get killed by Saul. He's coming out to win some battles, but he's still just seeing uh, that the Saul is chasing him and there's this back and forth. This is where a lot of the Psalms are written. A lot of people say Psalm 23, maybe the most famous song, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your shepherd. God, I mean, David is surrounded. Saul wants to kill him. The Philistine wants to kill him. The, the Amalekites want him. Everybody wants to kill David. He's hiding out. He's running for his life. Verse uh, chapter 23, here it goes again. There's another spot where Saul is trying to kill David. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. But David was in the wilderness of Ziph and Horish, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David, and he strengthened him in the hand of God. You, you've got to catch this verse. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David of Horish, and strengthened his hands in God. 
I'm giving you all these verses, and in just a moment, I'm going to tell you why all this mattered. But he strengthened his hands in God, and he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained in Horash, and Jonathan went home. Chapter 31, Jonathan and his dad Saul both die in battle. And that's the story arc. You get David anointed as king. Uh, Jonathan saying, I support this. What's going on? Then you've got this adversity. Saul wants to kill him. David's uh, being told by Jonathan when to run, when to hide, what's going on. So so here's the premise of of why this friendship is so famous and why this matters to us and why this little part of 1 Samuel is so important. The, The hard part about David's life is when you look at the narrative of David, you get more of the story of David in the Bible than anybody else. The story of David takes up a ton of the Bible. And so the narrative arcs are long. The narrative arcs take a while. There's a ton of scripture, a ton of backstory for like five chapters. They're just running and hiding and chasing each other. Like, did you read 1 Samuel? For like five chapters, it's like, David could have killed Saul, but he didn't. Next episode, David could have killed him again, but he didn't. You're like, come on with the story already. Like, it just takes a while. David's story takes a while, but this friendship has some key components in it that we can learn from and we can see. But here's the most important thing you need to know about this story, that God wants us to have friends. So from this point on, since we live on the other side of the New Testament, what I'm going to try to do is tell you what a gospel friendship looks like based on what Jonathan did for David. So what I mean by gospel friendship is if you're a believer in Christ, there is a knitting together of our souls that I have been saved by Christ. You have been saved by Christ. So when we meet each other, we have a soul connection far greater than we just killed some Philistines in the war. Like they had, like there is a soul connection for us deeper than I love the Seahawks deeper than go Cougs, deeper than all those things. I meet another believer and there is a soul connection that happens. Why? Because God knows it's not good for us to be alone. And God has given us friendship as a great, great gift. Even in the garden of Eden, all paradise, no sin. What was the, what was the only thing wrong in the story? The only thing wrong is that Adam was alone. Now, oftentimes we read the Genesis account and we try to talk about marriage, which is great. We try to talk about gender, which is great. We try to talk about all these things in the the Genesis of where the story began. But in its purest form, God looked down at Adam, made in his own image and said, that guy needs a friend. And therefore he gives him Eve as his wife, as a great friend. You guys know marriage is not just about being married. It's about a deep friendship, an intimate friendship, a knitting together of friendship. Even in paradise, it wasn't good until Adam had a friend. So I wanna tell you five things really briefly that God shows us in the story of Jonathan and David of what it means to be a gospel friend, how you can be that kind of person and how you can live to have that kind of person in your life. So number one, the thing we see through all those verses I just read to you, you go, Josh, that was a lot of verses. Okay, it's all gonna make sense. Here we go. Number one, um, a gospel friendship is covenantal. You you see in chapter 18 and chapter 23, I know there's a lot of time between when I read those two, but in chapter 18, David and Jonathan made a covenant. And then in chapter 23, they renew their covenant. Gospel friendship is covenantal. You know what that means? It means that gospel friends, they don't use each other. They don't bail when it gets hard. It means they're in this together. Friends aren't users of you. They don't just take advantage of you. Uh, The commentator, Eugene Peterson, he says, David's most dangerous time in his life is bracketed by the covenant he made with Jonathan. Jonathan shows up in chapter 18 and makes a covenant and starts protecting him all the way through verse, all the way through chapter 31 in the most dangerous time in David's life. And, And Eugene Peterson says, the only reason David survived this time is because of a deep friendship of loyalty with Jonathan. And you know what happens after David? Like the lineage of Jesus happens, right? Eugene Peterson just said, thank you, Jonathan, for allowing David to survive. They were in a covenantal relationship. There's a difference between being friendly and being friends. Like I'm friendly with my neighbors, generally, right? They're okay. They probably think we're loud. I I don't know. We like every now and then there's like 40 cars parked along our street and people come into our house and hopefully acting like Christians, but 
There's a general friendliness, but, but I think there's an understanding between my neighbors and I. I want to grow and become friends, but right now we're just friendly. That There is no real responsibility on any of our behalfs if something goes wrong. There's no real responsibility. We're friendly, we're nice, we smile, we wave, we say go Cougs. But at the end of the day, there's nothing really connecting us that is friendship covenantal. So, so what I mean by that is they don't have to show up when things go bad because we're not in a covenant. And Jonathan and David had this kind of relationship that said, we are in covenantal relationships. So I'm not gonna bail, you're not gonna bail. When things go wrong, I will be there for you. This is what covenant means. It means I will take responsibility for this relationship. I'll take initiative for this relationship. I'll be in on this relationship. Jonathan said, you can count on me. And gospel friendship says, you can count on me. You can count on me. I'm not gonna use you. I'm not gonna take advantage of you. I'm not gonna just, you know, get only good from you and then bail when it goes bad. I'm gonna stay with you. This, this friendship was covenantal. The second thing that we see in Jonathan's uh, relationship to David that, that can be gleaned from the scripture is that gospel friends are a loyal defense before others. Gospel friends are a loyal defense before others. We are told in the, in the story that Jonathan went to his father and spoke well of David. He stood up to his dad. And, and what did he say? He said, dad, you're wrong about David. In fact, you're so wrong about him that, that I've got to stand up and speak on, on David's behalf to tell him that he is a man of character. He is a man of integrity. You should not seek to kill him. He's not seeking to kill you. He stood up on David's behalf and was loyal to him when he could have betrayed David and David dies. And essentially Jonathan becomes, you, you know, the, the, the president, the king, the, the head of state, whatever you want to call it back then, that, that if Jonathan doesn't let David get safe passageway through this dark time in his life, that actually benefits Jonathan. But in this deep sense of friendship, you have a loyalty that goes beyond even winning and going well for you. So in its purest form, man, gospel friends stick up for each other. Jonathan just stuck up for David. To, to say it another way, um, gospel friends... They don't let other people speak against your character when they're present. So Saul wanted to speak against David's character and Jonathan says, you cannot do that in my presence because I have a covenantal gospel relationship with David. And if he's not here, then I will speak on his behalf. I will speak to his character. I'll speak to his integrity and I will protect him. So this beautiful picture of friendship that you see in the story of Jonathan and David is available to us in this, in, in this moment of going, do you have someone in your life that you know will speak up on your behalf, that will be loyal on your behalf, that will speak to your character and your integrity when you are not there? Because that's what it looks like to be the kind of friend that Jonathan was to David. Uh, the third thing we see in this picture uh, is that gospel friends, they give each other complete freedom to be themselves. They give each other complete freedom to be themselves. The, the scripture tells us that Jonathan and David kissed and wept together. It actually says it twice. They kissed and they wept together. There was this sense of, we don't have to pretend here. We can be honest here. I'm running for my life. I'm not gonna pretend everything's okay. This is a hard time for me. I don't know if David like showed Jonathan some of the Psalms he wrote, but like, hey man, this is what's really going on in my life. It's pretty brutal out there. Tell your dad to get off me, right? It was hard for them. They didn't have to pretend. There was a willingness to weep. So, so, so men in the room, um, is, is there a guy in your life that you are available to be emotionally vulnerable with? To weep together with, to pray together, to connect in such a way that you don't have to pretend and you can be completely who you are and you won't be rejected. You know, the beauty of the gospel is to be seen as who you really are and accepted anyways. You know that the beauty of the gospel is that God sees you in all your faults. He sees you in all your issues and he accepts you and loves you just as you are. What a beautiful picture of friendship when we see people just as they are and we love them and we accept them as they are. A lot of people get really uncomfortable with this. They, they kissed and wept together. Like be careful Google searching Jonathan and David because some stuff comes up afterwards that'll make you uncomfortable. Some people take these verses in the Bible and they exploit them to mean things they never meant. 
Some people take these verses and go, oh, look, they kissed each other. Oh, look, they hung out a lot. And they, they take these and go way too far. And so I, I had to find what Tim Keller, what do you think about this? And so here's what Tim Keller thinks about this. Um, he says this, he says, back then, I love you. If you don't like this, you're crazy. This is amazing. I think this is the greatest thing ever. He says, back then, when men were actually warriors, like actually went out every day and put their lives on the line for survival and for food, that they had to kill people all the time. They went out and they had to kill animals for food and, and, and protect people um, from, from prey that were coming out. And they were actually warriors and they were actually tough and they were actually men. When this was going on in the world and men were actually warriors, then they had no problem weeping and kissing because they didn't have to pretend they were tough because they were actually tough. Did you catch that? They were willing to weep. They were willing to hug. They were willing to kiss because they were actually tough enough to do that because their lives were on the line. The food was on the line. All of these things were on the line. They didn't have to put up a facade pretending they were tough. They actually were. But today, we don't know that we're tough, so we have to act like we're tough. We have to pretend. And we think that no crying, suck it up, get up, you're fine. We think that's toughness. And, and, and what Keller's saying here is that these guys had no problem kissing and hugging and crying together because they were fully aware of who they were and the men they were in Christ. You know, in Acts chapter 20, when they send out church planters in Acts chapter 20, it says they kissed and they wept together. So it's not just warriors fighting each other. It's even in the New Testament when these gospel-centered men, church planter, tough men said, we're gonna leave and we're gonna, we're gonna uproot our families to go and to start churches in other places that they cried and they wept together. This is the picture that you don't have to fake it. You don't have to pretend when you have real friends around. So number four, gospel friendship, gospel friends, they strengthen you in the Lord. What did that verse say? It said that they got together and Jonathan strengthened David's hands in the Lord. What a cool phrase. Strengthens David's hands in the Lord. They are a source of encouragement to one another. They put courage into you. They speak truth into you. They speak grace and they speak truth. You guys know you need a friend that can do both, right? You don't just need a friend that's all encouragement or you don't just need a friend that's all truth. You need grace and truth. You need someone in your life that can look at you and go, that is absolutely not who God's called you to be. That is not who you wanna be. That, that is so far off of what God's asked of you that I've got to speak to that. And then you need other people in your life that go, no, it's okay, man. I love you anyways. I know you're the worst. You're totally stupid, but God's got grace for that. In Jesus' name, amen, right? You need both. But oftentimes we have a hard time finding a friend that'll speak truth to us. And when they do, you don't wanna be around that person because there's something in us that just wants only encouragement, not any truth. Or we want only grace without any uh, harsh reality of who God uh, has called us to be. The book of Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's interesting. It doesn't say um, bad are the wounds of a foe. It says it's faithful when a friend wounds you when a friend tells you truth, when a friend encourages you uh, or, or in the negative sense, like discourages you in a good way, that that is a good thing. So friends are able to put this encouragement in you. Uh, I was talking to my college roommate the other day on the phone. Um, this guy was my best friend through college. Uh, he, he and I were roommates for three years. We, we had a similar calling, but he just took a church um, pastoring and we haven't talked for a while because it's just been life. And, and we we're on the phone and... Um, and because we're like real friends, like it doesn't take very long. You do the, hey, I'm sorry, I haven't called. But like within the first 30 seconds, like all that's gone and you can just start talking. Like you just never really missed a beat. And so we start talking about life. And he says this, he says, hey man, I want to have a healthy debate with you about multi-site church. And you know, Resnay has like six sites. So I'm like, I don't know if it'll be healthy, but I'm happy to debate you on the topic, right? Because we're friends, right? And I'm going to wound him faithfully. So, because um, we're brothers, it's in the Bible. Um, so, so we start talking and, um, and it's great. It's great. He, he's got, he's like really smart, like way smarter than me, but I'm just like talk faster and say rude stuff. So, um, so we're having one of those conversations and, and it's just going great. And, and towards the end of the conversation, um, we're just talking about ministry and different things. And, and I said something like kind of offhanded about um, just, just 
it, it didn't mean to be a big comment, but I was like, oh, you know me, man. Like I'm always the anti-authority jerk guy, hater. And I just kind of said some stuff like, ha ha. And, and he got quiet on the other side of the phone. And he was like, what are you talking about, man? And I was like, you know, like, you know, I'm just, I'm the guy that wants to question everything. And he's like, I still don't understand. And, and I was like, you know, in the church, like I'm, I'm really struggling to love people sometimes because I'm going through this thing where I just like every time I'm talking to somebody, like I just want to ask them questions and like kind of get into this lawyer mode or something. And he's like confused. And here's what he tells me. He's like, I don't know that guy you just mentioned. He said, because the guy I knew in college, the, the Josh that was my roommate, he said, I don't know anybody who had more of a pastoral heart in college than you. And I'm like, what, who, who were you, were you, me? Like, no, not me. Like I'm this other person. And so here's what happened. Like my friend, John strengthened me in the Lord because I forgot who I was. And I started to believe this other thing. The Myers-Briggs personality tells you you're supposed to be or that whatever tells you you're supposed to be. I started to believe some stuff way before I knew that stuff about myself and started to live into that stuff. He's on the other end of the phone going, that's not who you are. Did you forget I'm like, wow, that's really helpful. So something in the story of David and Jonathan where David starts doing this thing and Jonathan comes along and goes, that's not who you are. You need to be strengthened in the Lord. So I guess my question to you is, does someone know who you are so well that they can tell you when you're not being you? Do you have someone in your life that knows your convictions, knows your, your heart, knows your passions, knows what you cry about, knows what you get stoked about, knows what you get angry about. And when you start to get off from that and start to believe things that aren't true about yourself, do you have a friend that knows you better than you so they can tell you when you're not being you? That's the picture of gospel friendship. That's the picture of saying, that's not who you are and I know who you are and that's not you being you. Gospel friendship is this unbelievably strengthening in the Lord. My friend John, strengthen me in the Lord. The last thing you see in gospel friendship is that gospel friendship is most exemplified by self-sacrifice. Gospel friendship is most exemplified by self-sacrifice. Jonathan continually hides David, gives David news about where the, the adversaries are, constantly protects David all the way to the end of his life where Jonathan in chapter 31 ends up dying, fighting on behalf of David. Jonathan ultimately lays down his life for David. Uh, and, and right before that, he had renewed his covenant with David. Gospel friendship is most exemplified when someone is willing to self-sacrifice. Jonathan ultimately died fighting. Or to say it another way, David was saved through sacrificial friendship. David was saved through sacrificial friendship. Someone willing to say, I'm not gonna put my needs first. I'm gonna put your needs first. This covenantal picture, this loyalty, this connection, this, this self-sacrificing uh, ability that, that David saw exemplified in his friend, Jonathan. Um, Amy's dad has a friend who, who trains firefighters in California. I don't know if this is nationally the way they do it. If you have a firefighter background, please don't come up to me afterwards and say, that's not true, Josh. I'm just telling you what this guy said. This guy said that the way they train firefighters in California is they take, they take a class through all, these different, uh, through all these different trainings and all these different tests and all this, this physical toughness. But at the end, every single class has to do the same thing. Here's what they have to do. They have to stand before the class and the whole class is there and here they stand and the instructor goes along and asks one question. Here's the question. The question is for, for the guy that's standing there being tested, the question is, will this man quit on you? That's the question. And when you're standing there, the whole class has to answer the question, yes or no. And if one single person in the class says, yes, that man will quit on me, then you don't get to be a firefighter in that class. Your whole class has to stand and look at you and say that if I am in a building and it's burning down and you have an ax and you're gonna come after me, you won't quit on me. And if not everybody says yes to that, then you don't get to be on the team. Basically, there's this underlying picture and they even use the word covenant. There's this underlying picture that to be on our team means you're willing to sacrifice. There's this underlying picture of saying, you won't quit on me. There's this underlying picture of saying, when adversity comes, 
You're going to be the kind of person that is willing to go into the fire with me and for me. So what you see in this whole thing is pretty clear. You see that you cannot get through life without adversity. You can't. You can't get through life without adversity. And God has given us friends to come and to be a a person on our behalf when the adversity comes so that we might see ourselves through it. We cannot get through life without adversity. But God has given us a great gift in friendship that you'll never get through adversity without friends and you'll never get through life without adversity. Therefore, you gotta have friends to make it through. So when you, if, if we just take the story of David and Jonathan and leave it there, what happens is, is often you leave church going, okay, I need to be a better friend. Okay, I need to try harder. Okay, I feel really lonely. I don't think I have a gospel friend. Thanks for making me feel terrible, Josh. I need more friends in my life. Step one, get off of Facebook. If you don't have that, get off of Snapchat. Whatever the kids are into, find like a real friend. So if you're not careful, what happens in sermons like this is you go, way to go, Jonathan, but what about me? Way to go, Jonathan, but what about me? Or, man, David sure was lucky he had a friend, but what about me? I think what's so profound in the body of Christ is that this is not an exclusive picture of this one-on-one kind of thing. What what happens in the body of Christ is that gospel friendship abounds. The beauty of the story of Jesus and the reason why this matters so much for us today is, is that Jesus looks at every one of his followers and he says this phrase, In John chapter 15, he says this. He says, I no longer call you servants. Instead, I call you my friends. Uh, Because the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but now I call you friends. And he goes on to say, greater love has none than this than he who lays his life down for his friends. So we cannot keep this to be a cute Old Testament story where David and Jonathan have this great thing going for them. You have to realize that this is a picture of what should abound in the body of Christ. This is a picture of what should be readily available by all the people around you. Why? Because if there is someone sitting next to you who's experienced the blood-bought friendship that Jesus offers, then that person has a soul connection to you. Why? Because Jesus was the first friend to you. And because that is true, he has made friendship abound in the church, just as David was saved by the sacrificial friendship of Jonathan. Jesus comes along and says, the church has been saved by the sacrificial friendship I offer. In the New Testament, you see that we used to be called enemies of God and we are now called what? Friends of God. We are no longer enemies, but we are friends. We have been saved when we come into a covenantal friendship with Jesus where he has laid down his life for us. The beauty of gospel friendship is that we have one who has sacrificially laid down his life for us. The the second thing that's so great about this is that this is a covenantal thing. That what Jesus has offered us is covenantal. That Jesus will be loyal to us. He will will allow us to have complete freedom when we are with him. If if there is someone that you can have complete freedom with, friends, it is Jesus. That you can go to him and you can weep and you can pray and you can be yourself with Jesus. And that is a profound beauty of the fact that God invites us to come and be near him. He strengthens us in the Lord. And I think the beautiful, maybe the most uh, soul stirring thing for me is the fact that Jesus is loyal to speak on my behalf. That is the gospel. That because I am Jesus's friend, because he has made me his friend through self-sacrificial love that he laid down his life on my my behalf, because I am his friend, he will stand before God on my behalf and be loyal towards me. What a beautiful picture we see shadowed in the story of Jonathan and David in 1 Samuel. What a shadow of Christ that you see here, that Jesus comes on our behalf. And when we stand before God one day with all of our good and all of our bad made available, we don't have to plead with God saying, look, God, I did enough good stuff. Look, God, I didn't do that many bad things. Look, God, I promised I tried really hard. Look, God, I went to church a lot. We don't have to do any of that. We stand before God and we say this, Jesus is my loyal friend and he will plead for me. He will stand on my behalf. And because that is true, if that is true of any of you in this room, then what is also true is that gospel friendship is available and should abound in this room. 
that we should be covenantal friends. We should be loyal friends. We should be self-sacrificial friends. We should be the kind of friends that take up for each other. So the question is, how are we doing a friendship? Because what has been modeled for us in Jonathan and even more so modeled for us in Christ is now available to us in the church. So my, my plead with you, is that not that you would leave feeling guilty that you're not a good friend or even leave feeling like you need friends, but rather you would leave trusting the work of Christ as your friend and then encouraged and inspired to be that kind of friend to those around you. To be the kind of person that's loyal, to be the kind of person that recognizes what Christ has done for you is what you should do for those around you. Because in the body of Christ, we are not simply friendly we are walking in covenantal gospel friendship under the banner of the glorious gospel that Jesus will be loyal on our behalf. He will stand on our behalf and be loyal. And now, even more than that, that's what's coming one day. He stands here on our behalf, welcoming us to be free to be ourselves. What great news that is. Free to be ourselves. And Jesus is the great friend who will offer you grace if you need grace. He will offer you truth if you need truth. But the glorious truth is that he is a friend that you can come to that will welcome you to be uh, connected to him through this friendship. And, and that should stir up in us a passionate response in worship and a passionate desire to love those around us. So, through the story of 1 Samuel, through the story of what Jonathan and David experienced, we are invited to experience that kind of friendship with Jesus. We are invited to see that, that to your left and to your right, even tonight, that there are stations available where you can come forward and break off the bread and dip it in the juice, representing the broken body of Christ, the blood of Christ that was spilled, the sacrificial friendship. And you can tonight come into union with that again. So the invitation is pretty simple tonight. It's to be stirred again. If you've been a believer for a long time, if you're not a believer in here tonight, to be stirred again by the amazing gift of friendship Jesus offers. Friendship. He's not a distant savior. He's not a God who's mad. He is a friend who has done everything imaginable so that you could come to him. He's a friend that says, come to me just as you are. You don't have to clean up. You can come to me just as you are. And he is a friend that says, don't worry, I will be loyal on your behalf. And when you stand before God, you will not stand alone. You have an advocate. You have a friend. You have someone that's made a covenant to be there for you. And that is incredible news. And that should stir your affection. Because just as those firefighters say, well, he quit on you. Um, friends, the, the truth is Jesus is one who will never quit on you. You can trust he will pursue you at all costs. And something in me, when I hear that firefighter story, something in me wants that. Something in me stirs when I go, man, I want to be that kind of person. I want to have those kind of men in my life that won't quit on me. And then you read the story in scripture and you go, that exemplifies who Jesus is. He won't quit on you. He's a faithful friend. So may we respond to him in worship. Let's pray together.